It's harvest time. And all over the country, the race is on to bring in our food. And what's fantastic about our island is that over half of what we eat is produced here. British growers are at the top of their game. Many of the crops they grow are truly world class. But with unpredictable weather and changing consumer tastes, it's a tough business. Have we had enough summer sun for a bumper crop? Or has this year's wet August washed away the harvest? This is the time of year where growers across the land find out whether the blood, sweat and tears they've poured into their farms has paid off. From acres of oats in the north to mountains of sugar beet in the east. And orchards of apples in the west. We're following the harvests of some of Britain's top producers in three distinct growing regions, each with their own unique set of challenges. This is the moment of truth. Who's had a good year? Who's felt the crunch? Over the next three nights, we're going to find out. This is Harvest 2015. Welcome to the glorious Hampshire countryside. Officially, one of the sunniest parts of the country and I think rather pretty. I love it here, it's beautiful. And that sunshine has a huge effect on what can be grown here. All around us, we are surrounded by fields of vegetables and this is typical of the eastern part of the country. Which is where we're reporting from tonight. Stretches all the way from the Isle of Wight right up to Lincolnshire. It's a powerhouse of British farming and it grows much of what we eat. Here is a taste of what's on tonight's programme. Tonight, I'll be helping to bring in Britain's sweetest harvest. As a former greengrocer, I'm obsessed with the quality and taste of our produce. Wow. That is sweeter than the sweetest pear I've ever taken. As a mother of three and enthusiastic home grower, I'm keen to find out about the care and dedication that farmers invest in their produce. From the delicate harvest that proves small can be beautiful, to one of Britain's newest and hottest crops. Describe to me what's happening. Oh, it's something else. Plus, Herefordshire dairy and fruit farmer James Manning is out and about meeting with farmers up and down the country. How are farmers managing in this tough industry? I'll be reporting on the highs and the lows of this year's harvest. Give there us a go. go. I'm going to ruin the whole system now, but we'll, we'll give it okay. a go. Tonight, we're with one of the South East's most bold and innovative growers. Peter Barfoot and his team have managed to grow crops here in the UK that no one thought possible. From tender stem broccoli to corn on the cob, this harvest is all about pushing the boundaries. Peter Barfoot, you are a pioneer, I think <laughs> it's fair to say. Always looking for something different. What we've got there in here is sunshine, and we just had to find new products to grow in the sunshine. Can I lift the box? Because I haven't lifted a box for, like, over <laughs> ten years. Do you know, when I was in the market, when I was in Covent Garden, this tender stem didn't even exist. No, and this tender stem is a cross between broccoli and Chinese sweet kale, which gives us its sweet texture. Is that right? And this fascinates me, because, look, these I know as French beans, and I handled hundreds of boxes of these every day, and they all came from Kenya. Yeah, and we said, hey, we'll have a go at that. We can do that on the south coast of England. But so much of what we eat now is actually down to you finding out that it could be grown in this country, mm. finding sources for those things. We've got so much to talk to you about, Peter. But for now, let's see how it all began. I grew up in a small village called Botley, which was in the heart of the strawberry growing area of the Hampshire Basin. If I had became a strawberry grower, I would have been sixth generation. But uh, by the time I'd left school, I'd had enough of strawberries. So I embarked on a different journey. Rather than compete with the big players with better soils elsewhere in the East, Peter became a pioneer of new and exotic vegetables, utilizing the warm climate of the South Coast to produce vegetables that many believed could never be grown here in Britain. 
It all began in the 1970s. The first one, the easiest one, um, was courgette, which at that time was extremely exotic. It was called a zucchini. In the moment, we're harvesting between 200 and 250 tonnes a week of courgettes. Who eats them and where they go, I just have no clue. I've definitely described myself as an entrepreneur, always looking, always thinking of the next product. It's what's built this business from 21 acres to 6,000 acres in the UK. We're farming partnerships in 35 countries around the world. Peter was one of the first to import butternut, squash and sweet potatoes to the British market. Although Barfoot's biggest earner and the crop closest to his heart is sweet corn, which can be grown here. I get quite frustrated because I express to everybody, you know, I was thinking about sweet corn last night at three o'clock in the morning, they think it's sad off sod. But that's been my life, thinking about sweet corn, how you can grow it better, how you can grow more of it for less cost. So it's so funny listening to you talk about the exotic courgette. And now the courgettes is the mainstay of my kitchen and my garden. Yeah, well, that's where we started with exotic courgettes a very long time <laughs> ago. They're now mainstream, but we're in sweet corn at the moment, and that is still fairly uh, exotic. And you say we're in sweet corn. We're in fields and fields and fields of it. I mean, you're the king of sunshine veg. And I've tried to grow sweet corn at home with very little success. Absolutely rubbish, to be honest with you. Is it because, I mean, we can see we're minutes away from the sea standing in this field? We get plenty of light. We've got the Isle of Wight moored offshore. That's splitting up clouds as they come towards us. And most of the summer leaving us bask in sunshine. So you really are in, a, in an absolutely unique spot. And that's, I mean, that makes you world class. That's no exaggeration, is it, in the, in the world of growing yeah, sweet corn? Yeah, it gives us exactly what we need for growing sweet corn. And what we see over the, most of the countryside is maize. Yeah, it's maize. It's grown to make silage to feed the cattle on during, during the winter. Sweet corn's been uh, bred totally different out of maize to retain very high sugar levels. So we it, don't want to be eating maize, don't be tempted You to do not want maize. to be eating maize. It would be a horrible experience and put you off for life. But sweet corn, since it's been introduced, and it's wonderful to have you growing it in this country, is a super popular veg, isn't it? We eat more sweet corn in the UK than the rest of Europe put together. It's certainly something that we all love and certainly worth looking at in a little bit more detail. Succulent, sweet and sunshine yellow, sweet corn is protected by a tough green husk. Every adult cob contains around four to five hundred kernels, little yellow pockets of sun-fed sweetness. Sweet corn can be described as a cereal that's also a vegetable and is an ancient crop first grown in Mexico and Central America thousands of years ago. It took until the 20th century for it to be grown commercially in this country. The variety grown here is different to the sweet corn used for tinning and freezing. The corn on the cob has a lighter texture and more sugars and flavour. In the past five years, sales have almost doubled in Britain as its popularity soars. It seems this sweet treat is here to stay. So we're standing right in the middle of it, as far as the eye can see. How much sweet corn are you actually grow in here? Well, we grow 3,000 acres, but we're stood in a field of 50 acres, mm -hmm. which is about three quarters of a million pieces of sweet corn. I've got a question, forgive me. I mean, the, I can see the harvest are pulling them up now, yeah. but how do you know when they're ready? Well, quite simple. I walk into a field, I select a cob of sweet corn, and... Um, Peter, you, really? You still, <laughs> with all this machinery, you still peel oh, there's, there's nothing that beats the, the bite, the crunch, the taste, so this is it. And you can just <laughs> eat it raw like that. Look yeah, at that. Yeah, it's amazing. It's the way it should be, really, to can do we have that. a go? Take a little bit, just in case. Do you want an expert taster to have a go? It's super juicy, it's the first thing you notice. It's yeah. never normally that juicy. Full of crunch, full of sweetness. That is ludicrously sweet. That is lovely. I mean, you could snack on that raw, couldn't you? 
Yeah, this time of year is my lunchtime break, actually. Great. That is undoubtedly a beautiful thing, mm. that place. But <laughs> what I want to know is how is our harvest going? How are we doing? Well, for once, it's going really, really well. We've had a perfect season. We had a, a nice dry spring to get the seed in the grain. We've had warm weather through April, bit of rain in May. Nice bit of sunshine in June and early July. Tops up with a bit of irrigation, I may add. And then we've had a period of sunshine to finish off the ripeness, the harvesting is absolutely going well. So, so really, textbook, everything you need for good yeah. sweet corn right since the planting yeah. all the way through. Absolutely, but probably won't happen for another five years, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you've got to make the most of it. You finish all that optimism with a little bit of pessimism. <laughs> Quite right. And I'll you finish his lunch, eh? That's what I'm impressed with this. That's the farmer in me. So from one sweet crop that's eaten as nature intended to another one that needs a little bit more work, earlier in the year I went to help out with a harvest that is critical for many farmers in the east. It's February. Traditionally a pretty lean time in the harvest calendar. But here in Norfolk, there is one very sweet treat on the menu. It might not look it, but hiding inside this beast is a beautiful secret. One of my greatest weaknesses, sugar. As a nation, we eat two million tonnes of these white crystals every year. That's half a kilo per person per week. Historically, we imported it all from cane plantations in the tropics until 1747, when we discovered we could extract it from root crop grown here in the UK, sugar beet. Nowadays, we grow half of all the sugar we consume, which explains the scale of this massive harvest. Today, I've come to Holcombe Estate to find out just what it takes to feed our sweet tooth. You are going to let me drive that? Today, Greg, this is yours. No way, mate, this is enormous. James Beamish is part of an army of East Anglian farmers marching to bring in the sugar beet before spring arrives. I'm very nervous. <laughs> so am I. I <laughs> I'm very, very... How much damage can I do on this? Ah, uh, no, we'll be safe. We're in a big field. We'll be safe. Right, we're ready, aren't we? We're ready. Way. There it goes. No, no. <laughs> it's going nuts. Now, if you let go of the steering wheel, yeah. and move that joystick this way. We should be steering. Just let that take a few metres to find itself. And then off we May, go. this thing is moving itself. And you've got sugar beet coming in the tank for height. Yes! So how much sugar beet are we hoping to lift today? So today we would like to do 12 to 14 hectares, which would be a thousand tonne of sugar beet. Wow. Mate, I'm going to steer this manually. OK. All right, because okay. I've got more confidence in it. It's wobbling all over the place. Hang on. Yeah, I'm worried about filling up the back. What happens if we fill it up? It will overflow. It will beep and tell you that it's full. We've probably got a trailer full in, so I know if you want to try and call Ollie up, get him to come and unload. Uh, Greg in the big machine calling Ollie in the smaller support vehicle. So are we going to stop and unload? Or... No, it's, well, I think you've, you've gained enough experience now, Greg, that we're going to try and unload on the move. Can we do this? Is this how you do it? This is how I do it. He's here, he's here, he's here. Go on, boy. Now you press your top right button, top right. After a morning harvesting, it's time to meet the boss to see what he thinks of my efforts. <laughs> Hello, Paul. Paul Hoverson is the director of farming here at Holcomb. Well from, done. From a professional eye, how did I do? A little bit more training, one or two. We've left a little bit behind. Did I cut that in half? You cut that in half. Your eyesight, your steering might have been slightly out. That, though, is an odd-looking beast, mate, isn't it? You want to try and taste it? I would love to have a taste, yeah. <laughs> mm. 
Wow. Surprisingly sweet. Wow. That has got the crunch of a radish, and that is sweeter than the sweetest pear I've ever tasted. Sugar in its most natural form. Like a lot of arable crops, sugar bee is sown in the spring. All summer, the plants grow strong, converting sunlight into sugar, which they store in their roots to survive the winter. Left alone, they would use that energy to grow again in the spring. Except we don't give them the chance. Forty miles south of Holcombe is the largest sugar beet processing factory in Europe. Ideally situated next to some of the best beet growing land. Every day during the harvest, 800 lorries visit the British sugar factory at Whissington. Each one carrying about 25 tonnes of beet. Hey! How you Hello, doing? Greg. Welcome to Whissington. I've got a load of stunningly good sugar beet for you. That good? Dan Downs is the man responsible for buying all the sugar beet to feed this enormous factory. This is a lorry wash-off, Greg. And How does this work? And this is where the lorries are unloaded using high-pressure water, washes the beet directly into the factory. That, that looks like a lot of fun. Use this joystick here. Um, and move it from left to right. You said it water everywhere. And this is why you're behind a window, otherwise you'd be getting now really wet. Sugar beet is a vegetable, so you've got to treat it really gently, and this is a nice, gentle way of moving the beet round into the factory, and it starts the cleaning process off as well, washing the soil off the beet. Well, I'll tell you, you'd look forward to coming to work, wouldn't you? I mean, this is great, yeah. isn't it? Best place to work in the factory, this is. Once the beet enters the factory system, it's washed to remove any mud and stones from the fields. Metal arms remove any stringy bits. They're like combs. Yeah, well, that's not much use to me and you, is it, Greg? <laughs> then the beet gets chopped into chips before it goes into giant drums where it's mixed with water. The sugar juice is heated and centrifuged to release the crystals we all know and love. How's harvest been? It's been a very good year this year. Yields we don't completely know yet, but it's going to be a good year for us as a processor and also for the farmers. They're going to get a good income from the sugar beet crop this year. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> How many have you got there? Five. Right, there's six big ones. All right. There yeah, you are. heavy, mind. And a little half, six and a half. Six and a half. That's how many sugar beets it takes to make one kilo bag of sugar. This many? Well, I actually think that's really good. And we've grown quite a lot of these this year. Which is good. So, farmer James Manning, our harvest reporter, with the stats on the sugar beet harvest. What's the latest? But you know what? We knew it was going to be a good year. It's actually turned out to be a bumper year. So last year, they yielded 70 tonnes per hectare, which is good on a, on a normal year. This year, 80 tonnes. I mean, a massive increase. Is there a market for it, though? I mean, with that sort of increase? Well, this is the big problem, is that they're saying now they've got a sugar mountain in the UK, so, you know, big barns full of sugar that they can't sell. So it's interesting, isn't it? We spend a lot of time focusing on, is it a good harvest? And we've got a bumper crop of sweet corn here. But it's also important what's happening just after that harvest. It's no good for a farmer like you to be producing lots if you can't get exactly. rid of it. Exactly. And, you know, we're a dairy farm, so we're producing milk every single day, 365 days of the year. So, we, you know, we've got to sell it. We can't just store it in a big vat for 12 months and wait till the price is right. It's got to go. No, your issue is completely the opposite to the sugar producers. Exactly, exactly. You know, while we're chatting here, I'm sorry, but the harvest is going on behind me. You can hear the buzz, can't it you? It looks wonderful, and I'm just itching to get somewhere near it. <laughs> I really am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so much of the harvest now is about big bumper crops, big machinery, but it's not all about that. Sometimes small is beautiful. Strawberries are quite an emotive fruit. What does a strawberry mean to you? Carrying too many after pick your own. Wimbledon, 
fizzing in a glass of champagne. Mm -hmm. Like that one. Cream teas. For me, it's quite simple. It's the moment every year where I pick a strawberry and taste it, and it's perfect. And then that is the ultimate moment of summer. A lot of time and effort has gone into creating the strawberries we buy today. They're often grown in polytunnels to protect the precious fruit and raised off the ground to make picking easier. After decades of selective breeding, commercial strawberry plants produce large quantities of fruit, which are consistent in colour, size and shape. Look at this. Absolutely perfect. But when it comes to creating the super strawberry, do you think there's a chance that we've sacrificed taste for beauty? Possibly. But there's one strawberry that's bucking that trend. It's closer to its tasty but petite ancestor, the wild strawberry. It's grown purely for its taste, sacrificing size and strength. This is the very rare little scarlet strawberry. Now, you know the saying, it's not the size that counts. Well, ignore its diminutive size because this strawberry is packed with flavour. But compared to the robust modern strawberry, growing the little scarlet provides the manager at Tiptree's farm, Chris Newnham, with a challenge. Can I taste one? Please What's do. this? Find out what all the fuss is about? <laughs> so it's really intense. It's, it's fantastic. There's nothing, there's nothing to beat it. It's like a sweet. I mean, it's absolutely intense strawberry, isn't it? Yeah, very, very, wow. very different to any modern strawberry. So why is it so rare? Why do so few people grow it? It's difficult to coax into life in the, in the first place. It's subject to the vagaries of the weather. And then it, it, the final nail in the coffin, if you like, is that it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to pick. I mean, it, it's, what, a, a tenth of the size of, of uh, some of the modern strawberries? Yeah. So very, very slow, painful to pick. If you don't mind me saying so, it sounds like a farmer's worst nightmare. Why do you bother? Because <laughs> <laughs> we're gluttons for punishment. <laughs> it's just fantastic. It's unique. There's nothing else like it. So why wouldn't we want to carry on growing it? Well, because it is kind of the ugly duckling of the strawberries, isn't it? No, it's not. It's a little gem. <laughs> <laughs> little scarlets were first grown here over a century ago. Then, local villagers would flock to the fields to help with the harvest. Today, 128 years on, a small army of pickers has kept up the tradition. So the joy of harvest is absolutely in action here. So can I join them? Is it, is it possible for me to have a go or do you have to no, be a special? No, we'd be thrilled for you to have a go. We need to have you whistling constantly because then we know you're working to your best. Whistling? Why do I need to whistle? Try eating and whistling at the same time. Oh, OK. So this is the cunning plan to make sure no one eats the strawberries yeah, at the same time. Absolutely. <laughs> Protecting our investment. Nice. These incredibly fragile fruits grow best on the ground as nature intended and need to be picked slowly with experienced but patient hands. Many of the harvesters are holiday makers who have been coming back for years during the strawberry picking season. We come down on the 2nd of June. Then we meet Eileen, Dennis, they come down on the 1st of June. And we meet Shirley and Jim. All right, Jim. I live in Portugal, so I find it very cold. We don't meet in the year. You don't? No, do we? No. We just no. meet strawberry picking, but it's like we've never left them. How old are you? 80. <laughs> 80. And you're sledging between strawberries. And then you go, what? Like <laughs> <laughs> This is a seat in the world of seats, this one. Oh, it's fully mobile. It's very good. Let's see your hands. Everyone's got stained <laughs> red hands. Look. It does come off if you use dynamite. Chris said that we were meant to be whistling, so we didn't fill our mouths with strawberries. How many of you eat them this morning? None. Do you ever eat them? Yeah, when there's some big ones. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. What makes this so special? It's the taste. It's a very special taste. It's, it's so strawberry, really. You know, it's so, so strawberry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just taste 
taste it. You never taste anything like it. It's really lovely. The strawberries are so delicate that they don't transport well enough to be sold in punnets. So the only way this delicious fruit can make it to market is as jam. From the moment they're picked, they're already starting to lose their shape and disintegrate. And the point of this special jam is that it has the whole fruit in them. So from the moment they're picked, the race is on to get them jammed by the end of the day. So this appears to be where our strawberries end up in the factory. First thing that hits you is actually the smell. It's a really sweet, strawberry, intense smell. As soon as they arrive, the strawberries are washed and inspected for unwanted greenery. I'm getting a bit motion <laughs> We say to anybody new on the belt, try and just concentrate on the little bit in front of you. Who so... knew this would be so challenging? <laughs> When 70 kilograms of only the very best little scarlets have been cleaned and weighed out, they're ready for the boiling chamber next door. Sugar syrup is added to the mix, and in a little over 10 minutes, each one of these cauldrons can produce hundreds of jars of jam, which are then sold all around the world. And the man responsible for tasting every single batch is factory controller Walter Scott. That pop is our champagne pop. So you know you've made it, you've finished mm. when you get that pop. Whole strawberries in there. Lots of whole little strawberries. Is it worth it then? The next taste will tell us. Oh, it's lovely. It is, isn't it? The texture is really mm. nice. Mm. It's like a special part of England, isn't mm. it? Mm. Preserved yeah. oh, yes, in that it is. jam. Yeah. We're the only ones that grow this fruit commercially. So once the crop's gone, it's gone. Now, in this day and age, that's quite difficult to explain to our, some of our customers who say, well, go and get some more. But um, say, no, I'm sorry, but we've run out. There is no more till next year. And what about you? Do you <laughs> stockpile it? I have a secret stash. You do? I do. Where yeah, is it? I'm not telling. Oh. <laughs> no, it's here. It's do here. they know yeah, here yeah, that yeah. you have a secret stash? We will now, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> Now, that looks lovely, picking strawberries with your mate in a field. However, this is my sort of harvesting. Keep left a bit, Greg. Left a little bit? Yeah, left a bit. Nathan, now, you are, I'm told, director of the farm. What is a director of the farm? Well, I'm the one who pretends he knows something, but look after all the people who do know something. Are you in charge of harvesting? Does that come under your remit? The whole thing, particularly at this time of year, farm centred around harvesting, so it's my job to make sure we predict what we're going to do and get the harvest into the cold stores as quickly as possible on time. Quite a bit of responsibility. Some say. Mate, I'm good at this. You are. You're enjoying it as well, aren't I you? Mean, it's, <laughs> eh? it's just such a monster machine. It's like every little boy's dream, isn't it? You get one of these. Everybody likes a big toy. <laughs> I would actually like to get down and see how this works, because I can't actually see how it's picking them up. That's quite straightforward. So what we want to do is just go back a little, we'll shut her down and we'll go and have a look. Come on, let's have a look. I'm quite proud of myself. Oh, wow, that is a dangerous, angry-looking beast, isn't it? Certainly is. That's a big old boy. This is a sunny day, lovely sunny day. Does the weather make any difference at all to the harvest? Yeah, sweet corn adores sunshine. If we get warmer days, it picks up speed, but so do dads having barbecues. So the demand picks up too. That's brilliant. The it... sun shines, the sweet corn grows faster, but people buy them more. Exactly. That is brilliant. Can you show me now how this picks it up and why it doesn't crush it? Well, it's remarkably simple, really. The corn is the thickest part of the plant. The two base plates, you can feed the plant through, but the corn can't make its way through. And the rest of the machine's about gathering the corn up safely and securely. It won't go through the base simply because it's the fattest, biggest thing on, on the plant? Simple as that. 
that is easy, isn't it? The best things are the simple things. Most certainly are. Well, I found out how you get the corn cobs out of the ground. Now, Philippa is in a factory to find out what happens to them next. In here, it's like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, but for vegetables. As the harvest is going on, all the veg that are leaving the fields come here to be offloaded and processed. And I can see the sweet corn that we saw being picked coming out of the trucks currently. Absolutely tons of it. So, let's take a look inside. You're the technical director, and why are you keeping it so cold in here? What is it? Well, it's to make sure that the sweet corn stays fresh. So we actually take it from the field and put it through something called a vac cooler yeah. to bring it down to four degrees. How important is it to do that? It's really important. In this country, to make it work, it has to get cold quick so that you have a shelf life at home. So at this time of year, peak harvest, how many cobs are coming through here? So there's nearly a million cobs a day will be coming through this uh, this factory. And how many boxes is that? How does that translate? Well, you see there's quite a lot of boxes around here. This actually means that this store will empty and fill again in one day. You're filling it up twice and emptying it, and the sweet corn's going straight through. What next? Well, next, we take one of these cobs, put it through the factory, and that'll take three minutes and ends up in a pack. It'll be in a pack in three minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. all the stuff that comes off the sweet corn when we chop it. So we chop the top and the bottom off and take all the husk and that's it. But wait, some of this looks perfectly good. Is this all waste? It's not waste to us. This is actually food for our anaerobic digester. So yeah. this will get turned into gas, which then drive a generator, which makes all the electricity to power all this plant. Good. That's eight waste. and they're packing boxes like the wind. Absolutely. But that's understandable. You've got so much sweet corn to get in. But what about the rest of the year? Fortunately, people still like to eat sweet corn all the way through the year. So when you invest in a facility as big as this, it's really important that we grow it. And obviously, we can't keep growing in Great Britain. So we move to our own farms in Senegal. That's exactly where we sent our harvest cameras. 50 miles south of the Sahara, Peter and his team are using space-age technology and the secrets they learned back in Britain to plug the winter supply gap by growing sweet corn in the sandy soils of Senegal. Because when British bird life flies south for the winter, so do barfoots of Botley. The basic ingredient for growing sweet corn is sunshine, light and water. And here, there's plenty of water, thanks to the mighty Senegal River. 1,000 miles long and a mile wide, and fed by the mountains of Mali to the east. The problem is getting a constant supply of fresh water onto the sunburnt land. The soil is sand, which is just like the beach at home in the UK. 24-hour-a-day pumps deliver water to the crops along huge irrigation pivots. It enables the water to be irrigated in a very efficient process. We now have 20 of these 100-acre pivots operating in this area, producing crops which are employing people to work within those crops and providing vegetables that we take back into Europe. Despite the cutting-edge technology used to grow the crop, all 600 hectares are harvested completely by hand by 1,000 local people. 
The cobs are chilled to four degrees centigrade as quickly as possible to lock in their flavor. It keeps them fresh for their six day journey as they're shipped back to the UK. Sweet corn is not indigenous to Senegal, but the Senegalese have definitely developed a sweet tooth for it, and they're now every bit as passionate about growing it as Peter is. Well, sweet corn's obviously a very, very popular crop, but here, in the biggest runner bean field I've ever seen, and you're growing them by the looks about a tonne, but from what I understand, they're in serious decline, aren't they? Popularity, the runner bean? Very, very sadly, because they are, to me, the quintessential vegetable. This is British to the core. And nothing beats it for taste and flavour. The only problem is, you've got to work at it. As, as you well know, you've got to trim the outside edges, which creates the spine of the bean. That's why they're so beautiful and straight. And, and then you've got to slice them up. So the old French bean, is the one that's the most popular at the moment because quick and easy to prepare, five or six minutes in a steamer, job's done. How long have you been growing them for, runner beans? Runner beans, I've been growing runner beans since the uh, mid-70s, so a very long time. And we used to grow 200 acres, we're now down to 50 acres, and there will be a decision this autumn whether we ever grow them again. You're kidding? No, it's a sad old day, but that's where it's come to. No point growing anything, Greg, if you can't sell it. That's always been my motto. And if people aren't buying it, then I'm not going to grow it. That's a shame, though, mate. It, isn't it? It's a great shame. But things move on, don't they? You know what? Why I'm surprised there, they look exactly the same as they would in anyone's allotment. Yeah, yeah. And they have that same attention to detail and love and care. It's just on a frame, like it would be. Yeah, yeah. And, and we pride ourselves with having the earliest runner beans in the country. And in fact, the challenge is my birthday, 23rd of June, I want beans on my birthday. Is that how it's always been? That's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> They've got to get them right for your birthday they dinner. Have. And hopefully we will still have beans on my birthday next year, but it's looking a bit dodgy. I'm really sad that runner beans are in decline. So am I, Greg. I really love them. They're like one of my personal favourites. Yeah, they've been my favourite since I was a child. Listen, you're always innovating, I know. If the runner bean's in decline, what, what are you putting all your efforts into next then? Chilies. Yeah, I like chilies as well. It's the next hot vegetable. You think so? Yeah, I think so. Well, Philippa went to have a look inside the greenhouses right at the peak of the harvest. Chili peppers are the most widely grown spice in the world and are notorious for their fiery flavour. While birds are immune to the chili's heat and swallow the seeds whole, the red hot taste is there to protect the plant from being eaten by other animals. Isn't it ironic then that we humans have developed a defiant, almost perverse love of the chili? That means we have spread these seeds far wider than any bird could have done, including here to Britain. Chili plants thrive in their home of South America with long, sunny days and plenty of water and nutrients. So to replicate that here in West Sussex, Barfoots have developed a high-tech greenhouse where water-filled pipes act as radiators. Sensors regulate the supply of water and nutrients. And even the carbon dioxide levels are controlled using motorised vents and extractors. And the whole thing is under the control of Chile manager Tom Laprague. If you've got everything automatic for the plant, nothing left for you to do then, presumably. Well, we... we <laughs> you made life very easy for yourself. If you can control something and you're going to be that scientific about it, then actually all you're really doing is creating yourself more work. You end up going home, but you're still logging in for the internet, and you end up sitting in bed, literally just dialing in, making changes or correcting things. So I've got this image of you sitting up in bed at night, mm -hmm. checking on your babies, changing the conditions in which the chilies are growing here. Yes, that's correct, yeah. Wow. And my wife hates it. 
<laughs> Tom and Peter are trialling more than 30 different varieties to help them create a niche in the lucrative chilli market. If you'd like to take a sweet drop, this doesn't have any heat to it at all. You can take the whole lot. What do you think? Oh, no, it's not hot. No. It it's got a nice flavour, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Great for a snack box. Absolutely. And mm. these ones are the ones that I would buy for home. Yeah, Hercules. Like for chilli con carne. It's an all-rounder. It's something you can use with many different things. It's got the heat, but it's not overkill. Mm. Every chilli has different types of heat, but all of them have different types of flavours as well. Mm. For instance, the Aramillo, this one here, this is very fruity. This has a smoky flavour, not a huge amount of heat. And what is it with the heat? Why do, why do so many people love the heat? You get addicted to it, because the chemical in chilli peppers is capsicum, and capsicum is an addictive chemical. That's why you find that when you're really into chilies, mm. you find you need that chilli fix. So no, Yes, well. he's got it bad, so... hasn't he? <laughs> Well, I think this is an exciting market. We know that the profile of the chilli pepper eater is around that college university age. And they'll start off on the mild ones, and once they get hooked, they'll move up onto the stronger ones. And when you get more up the league of being a real chilli aficionado, yeah. then you'll be putting more in yes. and um, doing more things with them than just a few flakes in your scrambled egg. It's a new modern innovation into the English cuisine. Peter and Tom are confident this market is growing and that they can tempt buyers with their new products. Although they've grown one chilli that may not appear in the supermarkets for a while yet. So the brain strain is the strongest one we're doing at the moment, the second hottest in the world. We'd have a little bit of health and safety on that. Um, to be honest, um, <laughs> it, 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 so somebody has, I mean, if you have a heart condition or something, then uh. to eat a whole one of them would be, would be dangerous territory. It's ten times hotter than ones you'd buy in a supermarket. Yes, you heard it right. Ten times hotter. I'm not even going to touch one. But as a chilli aficionado, Tom is prepared to eat it. What's going to happen to you? Um... I don't know. I'm, Is I that you shaking? I am a little bit nervous. And you're sweating. And I'm sweating already. already. And it is rather hot in here. So here it goes. Oh. Now, the nice thing about it is that actually it starts off really low. Yeah. It, it goes up. Is it doing yeah. that now? Yeah, and... Uh, what, describe to me what's happening. It's... Uh, Inside. It's quite a punch. Yeah? Yeah, it's uh, a little bit hard to talk. Um, it's hot. There is no doubt about it, and my goodness. Is it getting worse? Yeah, is it's it? still... Where? Yeah. So it's burning the, the, in the the, the, You get a head rush, the you? blood just goes up to your head, and you've got to, you know, you're either stupid or you're just <laughs> something else. But, I mean, this is a one-off, yeah? Absolutely. Oh, it's it's unbelievable. Oh, it's something else. I think you're cooked, Tom. Yeah. yeah. Can I get some fresh air? Is that all right, guys? <laughs> Thank you. So we'll probably be looking for a new chilli manager tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> have you got some milk or something? Because water will actually not help. Oh, <laughs> oh Philippa, thank you. There you go. Oh. Now, I noticed that you didn't actually try the brain strand. I mean, poor Tom, like, he looked really affected by that. He was. He had to go outside for a lie down. <laughs> There's no way I was going to try it. It's just far too hot. I don't think they would have let me anyway, even if I'd wanted to. Now, something that hot, do you think it'll actually ever be safe to sell? Probably not in its current form, but there's a thought that you could sell it, in some sense, to infuse into dishes. But even then, one brain strain would be 20 vindaloo curries. So that gives you an idea of just how hot it is. Well, I physically, me and spice do not work. Me and chilies do not work. So I'm going to talk about something milder and sweeter now. <laughs> yeah, moving on. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> now, what I have got here is the sweet sprouting cauliflower. This is actually grown by Andrew Burgess up in Lincolnshire. And interestingly enough, this hasn't even hit UK supermarkets yet, so it's very, very new. So it looks like tender stem broccoli. Have you tasted it? I haven't. Shall we have a go? Let's have a go. Let's see what it tastes like. It looks very bright, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm not, I have to say, a big fan of cauliflower unless it's covered in loads of mature cheddar. Love it. But that, you can see how that would work great in a salad, can't you? You can also see why it's called sweet, because it is sweet. It's really nice. 
this could be our next big thing. Innovation for farmers is, is, is essential. And if UK farmers can get that right and keep driving forwards, you know, always trying to find the next new thing, like the sweet spreading cauliflower, it's what we need to do. And Barfoots are good innovators, but they're also good at efficiency. And in fact, something that's being uh, used today is a brand new bean harvester, which Greg is having a look at. I don't mind telling you, I am very excited by this. Yeah, this is the first time that we've successfully harvested British beans in this country with one of these machines, and it is brilliant. Is this going to completely revolutionise the bean industry? I mean, worldwide bean industry? I think key is getting the quality right. There's still some challenges to go, but it's meant that we've actually been able to harvest through some not so great weather, to be honest, but it's also managed to reduce the labour. Uh, productivity is key. We've got to be able to compete with some of the other foreign imports and, uh, and being able to mechanically harvest these beans makes this possible. What has previously been in the hands of some big foreign competitors, you are challenging it right here, right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to mean cheaper beans for the long term. So going into the future, what do you see? I see more British beans. <laughs> you are the new bean kids on the block, mate. <laughs> we are, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Can we go and have a look? Let's go have a look. Right, this is where it all takes place. Whoa. Come and take another look. I'll just put this one here out of the way. How does that work? That's just a load of spikes. So if you have a come and have a look at uh, this this uh, this plant here, the spikes actually just pull the beans through, and uh, and these brushes actually just pull these beans off the plant, and that means uh, that then we get a nice clean bean and leave all the rubbish behind in the field. It couldn't have been as easy as put the machine on the ground, fingers crossed, and off it went. It no, couldn't have been. You're absolutely right, Greg. It's taken a lot of time to get this right. First of all, we've got to get the right varieties. Um, it's important that they stand upright and they all mature at the same time. Secondly, the weather plays its part. We've certainly had some recent rain which knocks them over, and that's causes some issues. And thirdly, it's all about in the driving of this machine. This must be a very important crop for you guys to spend this much time and money on it. Yeah, absolutely. We know that market's growing and uh, it's very much it's, it's an important crop for us, uh, certainly for the future. Well, margins are getting tighter and tighter and James has been to Cambridgeshire to watch salad farmers there and their innovation in squeezing the most out of every crop. This part of the Cambridgeshire Fens has been farmed by the Shropshire family since the 1950s. But things have changed quite a bit since then. Advances in farming technology mean third-generation Charles is able to farm an area a hundred times larger than his grandfather. Large-scale operating has enabled him to survive in the competitive world of salads. Today's challenge, to plant 600,000 lettuces. OK, right, so your tray here, there's got 176 plants in here, all in line. And the aim of this is to feed the planter with blocks with this scoop. You've got to keep this machine full to so it keeps planting. Because if not, we have to end up hand planting it behind, slowing the machine down. All right, come on, plant. give us yeah. a go, give there us a go. go. I'm going to ruin the whole system now, but we'll, we'll give it okay. a go. So how many letters are we actually planting here? OK, so on average, over a week, up to three, three and a half million, sometimes four million, depending on the time of the year. We start planting early February and we'll finish planting end of August. Do we really eat this volume of lettuces every single day? We are eating between 10 to 15 million heads of lettuce per week. We are supplying about 65% of that volume. Do not let them run out. I'm not, I'm not Charles, don't worry, I'm doing <laughs> my best. <laughs> OK. The tractor is driven by a GPS computer to produce immaculate straight lines so every inch of soil is used. But Charles's passionate drive for efficiency begins in the nursery, where the young plants are grown. It's a futuristic place run by robots. Over the course of the UK growing season, they produce 135 million baby plants strong enough for life outdoors. Until 20 years ago, all of this work was done by hand. Automating the nursery has been a huge leap forward for the Shropshires, saving them time and money. 
but the planting still relies on a large amount of human labour, particularly when I'm involved. So how have I done, Charles? OK, well, look, oh, no. <laughs> look at the back. I don't think we're quite high yet. I think you need a little bit more training to start with, but generally, looking back there, yeah, I think you've done, you've done fairly well for the first time. While this machine may look as high-tech as it can get, Charles must keep pushing the boundaries in this fiercely competitive industry. His latest breakthrough is a Spanish innovation in planting that he's bringing to Britain for the first time. The system uses strips of small plants, all joined together in a long biodegradable tape, and the potential looks enormous. So what we've got here is a lettuce tape system we've been trialling where we've got 900 plants in a tray to the 176 plants in a tray which we were planting earlier on. We need to reduce how much peat we're using as an environmental part of salad and lettuce production. So you can see the difference here. This size of this peat block... That's oh, huge. It's okay, probably 10%, versus, isn't it? Yeah, versus the, the, the size of the plant. Put potentially up 90 95% less peat yes. over the season. Absolutely phenomenal, yeah. isn't it? The tape system uses a new machine that plants so fast you can barely see each one going in. This saves Charles a huge amount of time. It also has another advantage. When we plant with the machine, we're then seeing better establishment and a lot more even crop and up to 10 to 15% more yield per hectare. And then the people. We need 30% of the amount of people to do this as we do the conventional system. So the same job just becomes a lot more efficient and oh, a lot hell faster, of a lot more which efficient, must yeah. then bring your cost of production down. We are seriously excited about this system. I mean, this is the future. This is the future. The one area they still need human hands is harvest. Iceberg lettuces are surprisingly tricky to cut. And as with everything, the boss has very high standards. Forward action, slicing the bottom. Right, now that's too low. You need oh. a little bit higher. That is now no good. So we have to throw that away. Try and do it in one cut, one full sweep. What we don't want to do is overcut. The problem is, that will then turn brown and it fails the quality standards which we need to reach every day. So that needs to go on the floor. Right, that's okay, on top yeah. of the machine. Perfect. Right, next one. God, talk about working under pressure, Charles. That's just... Yeah. At the moment, we've automated as much as we can. Because that, that must be the ultimate, is if you could get a machine, a robot to come and bang, bang, oh, yeah. chop so every got, lettuce. We have people working on it full time on how we can automate this process. It looks like a giant marquee. This factory on wheels cost £800,000. Although it saves a penny per lettuce by automating the packaging process. Every penny saved can be reinvested back into the business. This machine never stops. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so we can get the full efficiencies out of it. All the guys have to do is just cut the lettuce and place on this machine. Everything else with the packaging is done above us. Once on the conveyor belt, the lettuce travels upstairs. Here, it's shrink-wrapped, heat-sealed, Boxes are built to protect the lettuce in transport. They're carefully packed, graded according to the quality of the crop, and sent off to be chilled. That was the vastest form of harvesting I think I've ever seen. Epic, I mean, truly epic. But what struck me was the amount of waste. I mean, I know a lot of it was caused by you. I wasn't very good with, with, with my knife, but... But so often, just because a vegetable is just slightly misshapen or slightly the wrong size, it gets wasted and it drives me mad. I think we need some education behind it because those guys growing lettuces, they had to grow the perfect lettuce, otherwise they, they couldn't sell it. So I think we need to be a lot, lot more accepting about the type and size that we actually have. It might look like we're in a field of waste here, actually, but we're not. This is still a crop that's waiting to be harvested. These pumpkins are still growing, just waiting to be cut, aren't they? They're they look really, beautiful, don't they? Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Right, let's have a look at our harvest headlines.
Well, I've already seen a bumper crop of sugar beets here in Norfolk and the east of the country, well, that is the bread basket of the UK. So how are we doing with wheat? Well, the wheat guys have had a good year, but do remember they grow wheat from north all the way down to the south. Sure. And actually, it's been a very, very wet harvest. Now, we've been looking particularly here. We've spoken to a farmer down in Shropshire, John and Edward Platt, and what they've said, it's been a quite a frustrating harvest because of the sun and the summer. The wheat particularly has been a bit of a snatch and a grab job. But the upside is that the crops have been very clean and free from disease. In fact, they've been as good as they ever have been. So they're happy boys, but with wet feet. But what about moving it back to the east? I've heard there's a really a good bit of news here. There's been some tremendous news here. A farmer called Tim Lammyman has had a world record year. He has hit 16.5 tonnes a hectare. That is an official world record. Wonderful news for him. So what about the fruit then? Things like our cherries, our stone fruits, the apricots? Well, cherries in particular, they've also had a great year. They were up 20% on their tonnage from last year. So phenomenal stuff from them. Yeah. On apricots now, this is a really special story. I went to visit a guy down in Kent who has had some serious impressive yields. As a farmer who knows his fruit, I was keen to find out why Robert Hinge is boasting an apricot yield better than any other year. We are in an apricot orchard at the moment. I mean, they look fantastic. How's the harvest gone overall? This is the best crop we've ever had. Why has it been that good? Well, it started off in the spring. We had very good pollination, um, which has given us the, the abundance of fruit that we've got now. Um, but the sunshine levels we've had this year have really helped towards increasing sugar levels. Yeah. Well, I think it'd be rude not to have a good little taste, wouldn't it? Yeah. Right, Thank nice. you very much. Nice and soft. Yeah. Mm. I'm used to eat, eating, like, you know, dry apricots on my cereal <laughs> at home with dry banana, but this is, that just, that is like real apricot flavour, isn't totally, it? That's delicious. Totally different, yeah. So as Robert enjoys a bumper fruit harvest, back at the farm, it's time to check on Peter Barfoot's veg. Peter, come on, give us your harvest headlines. 10 to 15% up across the board. What, everything? Yeah, just about everything. Well, how would you explain that? The weather, Greg. Ain't of dust in March, inch of rain in June, worth a king's ransom. So my dad said. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still the case now, is it? It's still the case now, and we had a good July on top of that, a bit more rain in August to finish the crop off. And now, once again, it's all about the weather, how we get it off in terms of quality and output, so. Yields are up. Yeah. Is that always a good thing? Well, always good when yields are up, as long yeah. as you can sell the crop, which is very important. Does, and it, does it happen that the yields go up and then the price comes down? Is it? Well, generally, it's uh, the equilibrium of life, isn't it? And yeah. I think that would probably sum up what most farmers in the UK would feel from this harvest. Yeah. Peter, thank you for having us here. It's been an enormous privilege for us. <laughs> We've really enjoyed it. It's such a huge variety of crops, so we can't tell you how much we appreciate well, it. Thank you very much for being here. And, and to you as well. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> yeah, fellow much farmer. <laughs> <laughs> well, join us tomorrow when we'll be up north, a region with its own unique set of growing challenges. We'll meet the farmers who've turned them into a success story. We'll be based at a family farm in Perthshire on the banks of the beautiful River Tay, following their oat harvest. I'll be investigating the Battle of the Berries and seeing why carrots are turning rainbow coloured up in Scotland. I'm enjoying this. And I meet a Cumbrian farmer who's pioneered ways of getting more from the UK's biggest harvest than anyone else. And you can see that tomorrow at the same time, 8 o'clock here on BBC Two. Well, next, reinventing classic songs from Lady Gaga to Queen. We're hoping for a showstopper. It's the Naked Choir with Gareth Malone. <laughs>